linguistics here at CS, especially in the Center for Asian Studies, which is embedded in the Department of Linguistics, as many of you know, because you're part of it. And as many of you are here, so <laughs> thank you for coming. So she has a very cool um, Marie Curie project that uh, she's conducting here. And the title is so big, you might have read it in her uh, bio sketch. Uh, I don't know it by heart, so I don't know what it is. It is very long, so I don't remember by heart, but the acronym is TOM, so you can search for it. She's um, talking about um, something which is related to the project, but not maybe like. Yeah. A side project of the big project. Yeah. She's been working on Tibeto Burma for a while and she also um, wrote a book on compounding, I've, I've learned. <laughs> and so if you want, you can read uh, a book um, if our library has it. I'm sure we, we have it. Um, but so uh, thank you so much for being here and thanks again for coming here and welcome to Trinity. Thank you all for also coming and uh, I hope um, enjoying the passive. So the passive construction is the main topic of uh, my uh, talk today. But uh, before I'm talking on, before talking on that, um, by way of kind of introduction, I shall frame uh, this particular topic in a broader perspective of reconstructing grammatical meaning in extinct languages. How do we do that, or what for? Also, um, I hope to well, the, the talk. Um, is intended to provide you or to present how tools, how tools that are supplied by our modern linguistics can help us in reconstructing some um, constructions uh, long um, lost from languages, like extinct languages, as I said recently, or that's only a, a very a recent a development that we are able to record and document languages on the verge of extinction um, that uh, were lost in the past few decades. Uh, but still, if we, if we um, start working on these languages, there is always um, a danger of, and this, this, this actually happened with uh, Tibetan linguistics, um, of danger of projecting what we know, how we understand modern languages, those languages that we have a more direct access to, projecting this knowledge back to these previous languages that we are interested in, um, in this case Old Tibetan. So this map shows you, this red area shows you the modern um, geographic distribution of Tibetic languages. Tibetic languages belong to the language family which we nowadays tend to term um, trans-Himalayan languages uh, but more commonly or in previous research uh, used uh, the terms uh, Sino-Tibetan or Tibeto-Birman languages. So you see this huge uh, distribution, huge area over the whole of the Tibetan plateau covered by speakers of Tibetic languages. Tibetic languages is a group of languages that all derived from pre-Tibetic. Those spots on the margins, on the borders of this Tibetan speaking area uh, mark some of the um, other trans Himalayan languages with, it, with which um, Tibetic languages are in contact or used to be in contact. Of course, one language which is missing from this uh, map is the one now prevailing in this area, which is uh, Chinese. So just to, not to blur uh, the picture, I omitted it. In terms of its, uh, as I said, historical development, uh, we have this long history of documentation of Tibetic languages. Um, for it started with pre-Tibetan, and um, we distinguish between various periods in the development of this uh, group of languages. Uh, I'm interested in Old Tibetan, which was the language of the uh, Tibetan Empire, a polity known as Tibetan Empire. Uh, between the early 7th and mid 9th century and roughly so we can also date uh, these languages and this um, graphics shows you the periodization of uh, Old Tibetan into ancient, early, middle and late Old Tibetan periodization made uh, on, the, um, uh, on the base of um, new innovations, uh, language uh, linguistic innovations and also uh, dialect diversification um, so these are um, spoken languages. On the other side, of course, we don't have any direct access to these languages. Um, on the other side, we have old literary Tibetan, which is a written language, and that's, this is the 
oldest attested documented Tibetic language we have. It started, its documentation started with the introduction of the Tibetan script, which happened in the early 7th century. We don't have uh, documents from this very early period, the old period, uh, the oldest documents we have come from the mid 7th, uh, I'm sorry, mid 8th century. Uh, we assume that um, uh, old literary Tibetan uh, at the uh, point of its introduction, like in the early or mid 7th century, quite um, faithfully mirrored the spoken language of this time. But we also know that already in the 7th century, dialects, various dialects um, developed. And here, um, okay, so that would be next slide, but still staying with this slide. So my <laughs> the most keyboard. Um, my talk today concerns two written languages, which is Old Literary Tibetan and um, Middle Literary Tibetan, usually referred to as Classical Tibetan. This is a language <coughs> that developed out of the old, of old Literary Tibetan by standardization, conventionalization of this language, starting about like 9th to 10th century, between 11th and the 19th century. We have this classical period of classical uh, Tibetan. Classical Tibetan is still being used uh, as a written language for religious purposes mainly. Aside of that, we also have a uh, modern literary Tibetan language, so I will not go into this. Um, so here again, the uh, periodization of old Tibetan mapped um, onto the um, uh, dialect diversification, those it doesn't matter for us today, but Proto-KT, proto what Proto-AT, those are Proto-dialect groups um, that uh, split off from the uh, particular uh, language um, um, phase. Uh, what is important in this context is to know um, that the construction I will be talking about today, with two minor exceptions, which I can explain to you in the discussion part, I will not go into detail during my talk, but with two minor, ex minor exceptions, this construction was lost. So we don't have any passive construction in any known Tibetic, modern Tibetic language. And this shows you, uh, sh shows us that uh, this passive construction must have been lost very early and my assumption is that uh, it was lost from the spoken language most probably already in, already in the 7th century, so long, long time ago. Uh, after this very brief introduction, um, now I move towards the topic of my talk, which is the passive construction. Um, and uh, the problem, why do we, the, the question, why do we have this problem? Um, if you study, if you look or learn, want to learn Tibetan, take a, Tibetan, a grammar of Tibetan, written Tibetan especially, then you will immediately learn that Tibetan verbs can have up to four different forms, which are listed for, like, um, a sample verbs are listed in this table, um, which I, to these forms I will refer as V1, V2, V3 and V4 and we will be concerned with the form V3. As you can see, um, this form is called here also future. And this is the name, the label you will find in all textbooks and in all grammars of classical Tibetan. Um, why future? Um, because this term, uh, as all the other present, past, future and imperative, is a exact translation of the um, Tibetan uh, terms you find listed below. Um, the problem is that um, this term, the future term, was taken over by Western grammarians in the 19th century, was taken over from Tibetan gramma, uh, grammars um, and applied to, to, label, uh, to, to label these particular verb forms. Mm -hmm. But nobody has ever done any kind of research whether these labels really mirror the content, do really express the content of the verbs, of, this ver of these particular verb forms, or they might have be these been mere labels. And actually they were. They used to be labels, but at some point 
this knowledge was lost. So if we look, sorry again, <laughs> if we look at um, this verse, I won't analyze it, uh, this is a verse 12 uh, from the famous treatise uh, the Takki Jukpa, uh, one of the earliest grammatical treatises written in Tibetan, probably based on a tradition that goes back to the 8th or 9th century. And this verse is assumed to, uh, to, present, to be presenting um, verb morphology of Tibetan uh, verbs. Uh, is it, it is writ written in a form which is very cryptic, so it uses technical terms the meaning of which um, was not necessarily uh, transmitted. Uh, what we see uh, when studying this, ver this verse is that the, the way the, the particular terms are used in this verse uh, diverges from what our grammar grammars are telling us. Namely, the V3 form, which we are interested in today, is termed there in this verse data, which means which means roughly translated present. So why do we have here the term present used and then uh, in uh, some other Western grammars we have at, uh, at once the term future. Um, so this, um, this, uh, these terms come from this uh, early uh, treatise uh, but we already see when we study uh, Tibetan commentaries on this verse, commentaries that, uh, as far as I know, the oldest uh, commentary on this verse on, on, or on this work comes from the 15th century and we see already in this commentary the author, its author, really struggling with understanding this verse. So by that time, the 15th century, uh, the tradition of uh, the, the understanding of this verse was lost. The transmission at some point was broken and we see those authors uh, commenting on this verse struggling really with, uh, with its meaning, especially with the meaning of what I call V3 forms. Up to the 18th century they were struggling and then um, um, a person known as Situpantian um, Chiki uh, a, a renowned, a very famous uh, Tibetan grammarian but scholar in general, um, was continuing the struggle. So um, he was about, uh, apparently very bothered by the fact that uh, this verse 12 uh, apparently was saying him something he just could not understand, putting it simply. So what he did, he rewarded the verse. He just changed the, I will not present his um, wording here, but he just changed uh, what the verse is saying, uh, claiming that there must be some kind of error in the transmission. Um, and what he did is he introduced these terms uh, calling V3 now Maong. So it was Situpanchen, for what we can tell, who introduced this or who switched the, the labels um, so that we have what we have uh, today, namely that V1 is termed present, V2 past, V3 future and V4 imperative. In itself, it's not a, it would not be a problem because we all, we all know studying linguistics, we know this uh, phenomenon that we give label one particular label to some construction or a phenomenon and we still know that the meaning, the actual meaning of this particular construction differs. Um, but here, uh, this, the, the awareness of this difference between la a label and the meaning um, either was lost or was never there. Uh, what um, Western grammarians uh, did, they took it for granted. So they interpreted these labels as really uh, expressing the grammatical meaning. Um, but still, even there, already in the 19th century, some of them realized that this future thing just doesn't work. So what they did was sometimes trying to translate or explain the V3 forms as necessitative mood in terms of something must be done. Not future tense, but something must be done. So that was kind of the trying to find a, a compromise. Um, so, um, but it still doesn't work. 
So um, what I did was to look at how these, this particular construction is being used in texts and what kind of help can modern linguistics uh, provide to explain uh, or to reconstruct its meaning because what the tradition tells us apparently uh, does not function. So if the V3 forms are not future, what else could they have uh, expressed? And if we look at uh, Tibetan verbs in Tibetan verb morphology, uh, we will realize that uh, we have a split. We have a morphological split between, uh, between uh, on the one hand, transitive and contralabor verbs, and on the other hand, all the other types of verbs, uh, like the dots listed on the right uh, side here. How uh, does this morphological split express itself? Uh, here are some examples. So what you see is that transitive contralabor verbs can have up to four different forms, whereas the other verbs, illustrated here with intransitive verbs, can have only two forms. So this second group of the verbs, the second type of the verbs, are miss missing forms for what I call V2, V3 and V4. Why is it so? Uh, this question was never addressed uh, in, in previous uh, studies, but it is quite clear that um, from what I've learned from typological, linguistic typology, is that um, this morphological split cannot be explained if we try to um, understand V3 or V4 forms in terms of grammatical tense or grammatical mood. So there is no, to my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there is um, no reason why intransitive verbs should not inflect for future tense, uh, future tense uh, if transitive verbs do inflect uh, for this uh, grammatical meaning. The obvious question is, if not tense or if not mood, then what? And um, the also another obvious, to me at least, obvious answer was that the grammatical um, category uh, that uh, might be responsible for this morphological split is grammatical voice with these uh, basic um, values such as active voice, passive voice being a possible solution. We also have some other voice um, types like middle voice or uh, anti-passive or some others. But uh, I um, claim for here for passive for both these forms, V3 and V4. Uh, I will not uh, discuss today V4 forms. I will only concentrate because these are a bit of these are more simple. But uh, the, the big problem in Tibetan linguistics is the semantics of V3 forms. Therefore, I will um, stay um, with this. So here we say already. In terms of morpholo verb morphology, we have a problem that we have to kind of address um, why uh, this split occurs. On the other hand, we have also other problems like um, if we are reading, we, if we read Tibetan text, as I said already previously, previous authors realized that this future somehow doesn't work and necessitative also is not always the best solution. And here I will give you examples from all Tibetan that show uh, why uh, do we have why, why these uh, um, answers future or necessitative do not work uh, before um, commenting on these examples i shall mention that um, well, two remarks um, i owe to you the first is that my translations into english you will see are rather literal for a good reason well good or bad but for the reason that i wanted them to kind of um, show you a bit of the, um, the, the, the structure of the Tibetan clause. And, and the second thing is that I will usually quote two examples for each kind of phenomenon or each tool I will present, but we'll only discuss one of them. And if you, you have questions later on, we can then go back and discuss the other example to kind of convince you that it's, it is like I'm saying it is. <laughs> uh, so what we see here with this first example, the Ptsampo, that was the official title of the emperors in the Tibetan Empire, 
the son Cri Ndus Srong was given birth to at Hlalung of Skregs. Uh, what we see here is the use of the verb bltam, the verb marked with the blue color, and this is a V3 form of a verb. Uh, this example comes from the work known as the, the Old Tibetan Annals. Uh, this work records events of the past year. So we have not, not all the events, the most important events, and the birth of, a, of an heir to the throne was one of such events. So after the year was kind of finished, um, these records were being um, written down or at least um, um, put together to form in, in form of this work. So certainly these events were presented uh, as past events, so something that already occurred. So it is not possible to understand this clause if we interpret uh, the verb, the V3 form, as future uh, in any way, because the, the clause apparently records an event that's already occurred. And also the necessitative meaning doesn't make sense at all here for this very particular kind of events like giving birth. So uh, here we see the first clash that um, the grammatical meanings provided by uh, grammars, Western grammars and Tibetan grammars just do not work. So uh, another thing that also draw, drew some uh, attention of uh, already was realized in previous work is that uh, Tibetan languages, uh, written Tibetan, uh, in written Tibetan each of the verb forms can be nominalized by means of conversion. So we just take a particular verb form and we can turn it into a noun. There are also other means of nominalization, but simply as it is, by conversion it works as well. And uh, with V3 forms, uh, we see it. That means uh, these forms can be converted into nouns, like those listed here in the um, left column. Uh, what connects all those nouns is their pa patient orientation of their meaning. So um, here again, this uh, pointing towards uh, passive uh, is already indicated again in a kind of more for semantics of the language. Literature on, on passive is already quite vast and we do find um, some commonalities on various levels how passive can be defined uh, as a cross-linguistic um, um, category. Passive codes patients as subjects. Then passive also um, are characterized by reduced valency, syntactic valency, but on the semantic level they still are um, transitive, semantically transitive, which means uh, they imply uh, the existence of an agent and a patient. Pragmatically, um, passive is, is defined as, agent, as an agent defocusing uh, construction with topicalization of a non-agentive element and a construction that creates a syntactic pivot. So those are certain uh, properties that um, recur, have been identified in um, uh, uh, linguistic typology that I show now. A kind of a contrast or um, compare with what do we find in Old Tibetan um, to check whether um, these universal properties can be found in Old Tibetan in a way that could help us confirm that the V3 forms are really passive. So um, starting with the syntax and the reduced valency um, again, example number four, the first on this slide, comes from a, a ritual text, an Old Tibetan ritual text that uh, ritual texts use a figure of speech known as parallelism. Um, and in Tibetan, uh, this figure of speech has a very particular, um, again, construction, so it juxtaposes to either two phrases or two clauses. Um, the, the issue, the clue is that they have to have completely the same construction or the structure. 
the difference is that the second phrase or the second clause replaces the vocabulary of the first clause with its uh, honorific equivalents. So all Tibetic languages have uh, something we call an honorific register, which is used whenever a person, a respectful person, either is talked to or talked about. Um, and this honorific register functions so that each, voca each item from the vocabulary has its uh, equivalent, so it has a different word which is its honorific um, equivalent. So what we have here is that our first, the, the, this is a parallelism in which two clauses are put together. The first clause ends with the verb byung, which is in all Tibetan uh, languages is this an intransitive monovalent verb. In a construction like parallelism, we would expect, or it is the requirement, that the same syntactic properties are also um, expressed by the second verb. And what we find as the second verb is again a V3 verb. It is the same verb Biltam which we just had in the previous example, but um, the, the, the most important thing is that it is the V3 form, which means here clearly this verb must be a monovalent verb. So we see here a case of reduced valency because the verb tam, uh, the basic form, is a transitive verb uh, with the meaning uh, to give a birth. So one uh, future we have uh, we find confirmed on the semantic transitivity level. As I said, um, despite their uh, reduced valency, passive uh, constructions. Oh, there is a lot of mismatch. <laughs> um, Still, um, are semantically transitive. Uh, if we look at this, uh, at the translation, whatever grain taxes in barley or rice are to be paid, the staging post for their delivery will not be moved to a more distant place than it is now. And the second example, whatever is under one's sway, serves fields, pastures, fallow lands, or forests, gathered in the hands of the descendants of Slagong, will not be taken back to the authorities, diminished or taken away by others. These two examples come from two different edicts, which are legal texts, so they, they belong to the genre of legal texts. And this is exactly um, the context in which uh, these V3 forms are found most commonly in Old Tibetan, which means in legal texts, also in ritual texts. Why? Uh, because uh, these are texts that stipulate something. They, they uh, prescribe particular way of acting or particular rules that must be followed by everybody. So we have what we have here is an unspecified or indefinite subject or agent, actually agent acting behind. We are not here concerned with events that are assumed to be happening out of themselves. There is an implied agent even, even though we are talking now about the future and uh, it is obvious we cannot say exactly what or who will be uh, doing or will not be doing, will be prohibited from doing certain things, a human being is still assumed and that's uh, what uh, semantic transitivity is about uh, with uh, passive constructions. So again here we see another um, property uh, confirmed. Now we come to the most important uh, part of um, uh, this proving uh, the passive, which is pragmatic. So how this um, particular construction is really used, what are the functions, its functions in the text. And um, agent defocusing uh, means agent is kind of backgrounded in, in, in the discourse. Um, but the point uh, about proving it, uh, that the agent defocusing, uh, is very difficult in Tibetan as also in many um, other Asian languages because those languages, as Tibetan, uh, tend to omit uh, core arguments from the clause. So if we have a clause, any clause, uh, without an agent, uh, this does not have to be a passive clause. 
because agent uh, as usually uh, being also the subject, uh, syntactical subject of a, of, a, of a sentence can be readily omitted um, in um, Tibetic languages in general. So how to prove that what we have is actually agent defocusing and not um, agent omission um, due to the, uh, this particular um, characteristic of Tibetan languages. We have to look for contexts in which um, this might uh, be uh, this might be the case. Um, so in which it is it might be easier for us to prove that we have here agent defocusing and not agent emotion. Um, and this case is and we can make a case out of it, especially when looking at the discourse beginning. So when a discourse uh, uh, begins whether a written or a spoken discourse, the basic information has to be provided to the participants so that everybody knows what is being talked about. Later on in the discourse, when we all already know what is being talked about, elements can be left out and all the languages have some means or ways to um, either to suppress arguments or to uh, kind of um, give the, the um, hearer the information um, which is not expressed overtly. But if we look at the beginning of a, of a discourse, then, as I said, all the elements has, have to be stated there. So what where to look for agent defocusing as, a, um, as another indication that we have a passive construction here is exactly in the, in the passages like this one, this uh, very, well, this short clause is the first clause in a story. So here a story begins and what we read is what occurs from meditation maxims of the meditation master Shin Ho, the sign of truth has been accomplished. So this very first clause of a new story clearly does not contain any agent. Uh, should agent be part uh, of, of the of its syntax, it would have to be uh, stated explicitly. But we don't have here an agent. Instead, we have a V3 form of a verb, that is this abs group uh, form. So this is a very nice example um, showing uh, what I said, agent defocusing. Uh, this is a, an example from, uh, from a Buddhist Chan text. So. Um, the, the meaning might not be uh, quite clear, but this agent defocusing also here is demonstrated because this sentence, the sign of true has been accomplished, also is valid for everybody that would at some point um, practice Buddhism following this uh, meditation master Xin Ho. So we cannot um, establish who the subject is concretely. The subject is unspecified here. Um, topicalization of a non-agent um, is, a, is the, the other side of the same phenomenon, I would, I would say. Um, this is a passage from a ritual text. The born priest, a particular kind of uh, ritual specialist, responsible for preparing the eight threaded nets, having determined the extent of power, made two tallies. One was delivered to the entourage, lords of great authority, one tally was delivered to the ship mound. What we have here are two V3 verbs, or the same verb but repeated twice. And it is interesting because um, the subject, um, the patientive subject of these two clauses, which are here marked with this red color, are each followed by the syllable ni, uh, which is um, the uh, focus particle in Tibetan. So we, we see here the subject of a V3 verb uh, explicitly made um, the topic of, of, this, uh, of these two clauses by using this particular uh, uh, syllable marker. But even more um, clearly is the situation as when we look at the uh, first two clauses I'm sorry, there is some, again mismatch, but uh, in the transliteration the verbs are uh, marked correctly. So we have here these two verbs, bchat and bgiz, which are perfective forms. They are active uh, verbs. And with them, we have also an agent. 
So we have here two active clauses with a clearly overtly stated uh, agent, agentive uh, subject. Uh, but then we have the switch towards V3 in the following clauses with with the topicalization of the new, uh, well, not the new uh, subject, because the subject is being introduced um, in the first clause as the tally, it is being then taken up uh, and uh, used as the subject of, um, of uh, passive uh, clauses um, in the following uh, text. So this is a nice example contrasting um, active with passive uh, forms. And um, Finally, the syntactic pivot uh, is used uh, whenever uh, an argument has to be upgraded or um, moved to the, to this, uh, the syntactic function of, of subject. Uh, like here we have in this first example, number, or example number 10 actually, uh, we have here two verbs, uh, two clauses linked to each other and in Tibetan and Old Tibetan um, subject of the first clause, if co-referential with the subject of the second clause, can be omitted from the second clause. And that's exactly what happens here. Uh, but the first, uh, the verb ktsak uh, of the first uh, um, clause clearly states, again, this is the V3 forms, which indicates that we have here one core argument, in this case that the, and this argument has to be the subject because otherwise it would not be allowed to be omitted from the second clause. So we look, if we look at the second clause with the verb mi shocks, we see that this clause doesn't have a subject, um, which again was zeroed. So to say it is expressed by zero anaphora. Another way of uh, creating syntactic pivot or another context um, is um, the um, rel relativization switch so <laughs> the screen red tangle should be moved and the uh, oh sorry the relative clause is actually this part uh, with go uh, being put into the subject uh, position by using this v3 verb form it is put into the subject position because the next verb mi bugak again is a v3 verb and it, again it requires only one argument uh, which is its subject. Uh, to look at the history uh, if, as, as far as possible of the marker itself. I, I told you that um, this, uh, the v3 forms uh, have uh, one particular, well not one, but are marked in a particular way. So here we have this red color marks the markers of uh, V3. Um, with the third mar marker B, it has a very particular distribution, we don't have to bother about this. This, this, this um, other form occurs only when the V2 verbs have B and S. So, um, so this is uh, conditioned by the form of the V2 verbs. But, um, so we are left with G and D as two uh, allomorphs um, of, uh, of V3. Uh, unfortunately for the, for the historical reconstruction, um, these two prefixes, not only uh, with these uh, verbs, but in general have complementary distribution in Tibetan, uh, meaning that ga or g is uh, always used before acute consonants and d always before grave consonants also outside this context and this says this means that it is not possible for us to uh, from tibetan alone to reconstruct which uh, or to, to say which form was the uh, original one uh, what we can do and what we have to do in this case is to look for other languages, cognate languages, that could kind of help us with explaining this um, phenomenon or with um, reconstructing the source of this uh, prefix. Uh, before doing so, we also realized that uh, the same, well, not the same prefix, but that Tibetan, uh, old Tibetan, um, had a nominalizer 
uh, with the same form, uh, G or the same uh, distribution, G and the D, nominalizer that formed uh, nouns from uh, adjectives and verbs, like um, shown in this examples. And this is important because um, this kind of nominalizer was reconstructed to Proto-Trans Himalayan and its reflexes are uh, preserved in many Trans Himalayan languages and this was also shown and reconstructed in a very nice paper by Linda Connor, um, on whose research I am now basing my, uh, this part of my talk. Um, in Old Tibetan, we have two forms of um, uh, participles. Uh, participles can be formed uh, from V1 verbs and then we have imperfective participles like burning fire or we have perfective participles as uh, such as imposed taxes. This is the, the, the kind of uh, construction or way of forming participles that is prevailing in Old Tibetan and in Classical Tibetan. However, if we look carefully um, at Old Tibetan data, we also find this kind of participle constructions, so formed from V3 forms, verb forms, uh, participles that are used as uh, attributively uh, with a noun uh, phrase. Uh, this kind of examples, as I said, uh, we have only very few, I have identified maybe a dozen of such examples, uh, which uh, means that they, this construction was not very uh, productive already in Old Tibetan, but uh, for our, for my purposes, uh, most important is the comparison with these constructions, with constructions like this one from Limbu, another trans Himalayan language, uh, in which we do see um, the same kind of formation or construction in which a verb, in this case it is the verb DENG, is nominalized with the ke, prefix ke, which is uh, the same trans Himalayan nominalizer as this GA form, then it receives also BA, which is a participle uh, for formant, and uh, this whole ke deng ba is used attributively to a noun phrase. So the same use as we see it in example 13 with uh, Old Tibetan. And then we also have the wrong slide, uh, Tsoptum, again using the very same uh, nominalized verb ke attributively uh, to, um, to describe, to modify a noun phrase. So what this is tell us? Uh, it tells us that um, this, the V3 verb forms uh, came into being in Old Tibet, Proto-Tibetan um, from or developed from a um, trans-Himalayan nominalizer um, and at some point they acquired this passive meaning and how this happened um, is the grammatica shows us the grammaticalization path that I reconstructed for Proto-Tibetan so first, as I said, we have this trans Himalayan, actually proto trans Himalayan nominalizer G, uh, that uh, developed into Tibetan or simplified in proto Tibetan to a single consonant G. Here we have uh, the the solution to that, to our question, which form D or G was the original one, by comparing our um, old Tibetan data with this trans data from trans other trans Himalayan languages, we can clearly state that it was G, which was the, the primary form. Uh, in the second um, stage, um, verbal adjectives were built, as they are still being built in, uh, in Limbu uh, or in Tsoptum, uh, by um, applying this G prefix, nominalizing prefix G to a verb stem and adding another nominalizer PA. And finally, this whole thing was reanalyzed, or the verb form was reanalyzed as a passive verb, and at some point, uh, most probably still in uh, prehistorical times, uh, these verbs were included into the paradigms of uh, Tibetan verbs as forms which I call V3 forms. Um, to, to the very well final remark, um, and data for which I will not present to you. This um, 
grammaticalization path from nominalizer, nominalizing markers towards passive markers is not very uh, special. We know it from other languages as well, among others, Indo-European languages. Also, some of them went through this uh, path. So um, this again confirms uh, cross-linguistically that this um, kind of development is possible and again it supports my claim that V3 verbs uh, were originally passive or expressed passive um, voice um, but this meaning or this verb form was already lost very early from the spoken language um, and therefore is not preserved anymore in um, modern languages. And with this very last remark, <laughs> I also shall conclude, finish my uh, talk.